descending like a cloud. You're standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Stand. joy of the Lord. 
gift of your glory, that you shine it down on our faces, a glory that we have no deserving of. But Christ saw fit to glorify himself, and you saw fit, and the Spirit, the Father, Son, and Spirit in one. You saw it glorifying and redeemable to pick up sinners and bless us and make us your children. Father, this has been a humbling Sunday. This has been a humbling day, a day where you say, I am your Lord and you are my kids. You are mine. I will rise up and be their God and they will be my children. We have nothing to bring you, Lord. We don't have gold or silver or frankincense or myrrh like the wise men did when they brought gifts to Christ. We have nothing. We have sin. We have brokenness. And so this morning, as we come, as we are, we ask that you pour out your spirit on us again. And that whatever happens today in this room, whatever happens today in this city, on this planet, God, we ask for your will. And we ask that we can be in agreement with your will. We recognize that all that you have is good. You are the Lord of the better things. I will make all things new, says Christ. And so we ask today, as we're in this room and we lift up praise, all that our hearts have, that we have true hearts of worship, that it not be about the music and not be about our circumstances and not be about frivolous things, but it be specifically to commune with you today. That we come and we give you our sin, we lay it down, and we pick up the cross instead and say, oh, my God, <laughs> look at who you are. Look how great you are. Look how mighty you are and majestic is your name. Let us say everything else falls away. My, my home, my nation, even my, my family, my children, my husband, my wife, I lay it all down for you, Lord, because you're the one my hope is built on the sacrifice, the gospel that Jesus Christ died for us, rose again, conquered death, and will come again. Let that be the only thing on our heart. Let that be our heart song today, Lord, as we lift up our voices in whatever way we can. Our spirits are yours, our lives are yours, and our redemption and our identity is in you. We ask that we agree with what you do today in this place whether it's conviction, whether it's healing, whether it is overwhelming joy. We want to agree with you today, Lord. So as we lift our voices and we sing, Hosanna, save us. We know you have. We hold steadfast to that. And we give you all the praise, Jesus.
Father, we pray now in Jesus' holy name, the righteousness that comes from him alone. May we have the freedom now to trust in his work so that we can walk before you. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ that our experience in this room would match and even exceed our experiences with you at our highest points in life. When babies are born, um, when we're right where we need to be at the right time, when we see a miracle when we finished a semester of school and we're cruising in our truck with a window down, all of those great times of peace, of restfulness, of, of okayness, we pray, Lord, that you would exceed that in this room today. And we pray, Lord, that we could taste and know that through trusting in the blood and ministry and life, death of Jesus Christ and his power and resurrection, that when we have faith in that, you give us an, okay, an okayness that is not conditional, that we never have to leave. It doesn't have to be at the end of a semester. It can be during the middle of the semester. It doesn't have to be when a baby's being born. It can be during the pain of, of, uh, of bearing that child. It, it doesn't have to be um, when things are right. It can be all the time. We pray for the peace that passes all understanding, the peace of Christ that doesn't even make sense. We pray the peace would own this room. And in a moment as we pass the peace, we pray there's a palpable feeling and truth and power of exchanging a peace that's foreign to this world of holiness of Christ Jesus. We pray all this, Father, in his Jesus' holy name, the one who taught us to pray to you by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please pass the peace of Christ. One, two, three. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Time to share the Lord. Please have a seat. Jerry's Sunday school teacher went long. It was me. Um, it's hot in here. We're getting that fixed. Where's praise God? <laughs> we're, we're getting that fixed. Um, it's real quick. Um, we have a team that's always at work in this church. Jim Evans is kind of the head of that group. They work diligently uh, to create a safe and clean environment so that we can lean back and trust the Lord. And uh, some days when it's a little hot in here, it should be a good reminder of how much we appreciate those guys. So if you see Jim or you see anyone walking the halls doing some work, cleaning some stuff up, uh, that's their offering. That's their ministry to Christ Jesus. They take it seriously, just like I take preaching seriously. I know you take your vocation seriously too. So let's, let's constantly be encouraging to each other. But we're not here to talk about us. 
We're not here to talk about how many cans of food the canned food drive received or how many people like us or something. We're here to talk about Jesus. He is the cornerstone of Christ's church. And this morning we remember him through the gift he gave us of Holy Communion. And uh, once again, if, if you're confused about where you stand with God on the basis of what you've done or haven't done, if you're still confused about that, listen to the words of Jesus. If you think that you can walk with Jesus and be a fan of Jesus and not understand that he actually has atoned for your sins, that he died on a cross that was necessary, and you just want to be a friend of Jesus and, a, and copycat or something like, what would Jesus do stuff? If that's where you are, listen to these words because Jesus didn't say, here's my life for you to copy. He said, here's my body broken for you. So when I say these words, I want you to be thinking for me. For on the night Jesus was to begin his great work of atoning sacrifice, praying in the garden, arrested, spit upon, accused of all sorts of things, when he was beaten to a pulp, when he was still told to die on a cross and he carried it with some help and he gave up his soul and he shed every ounce of his blood. When Jesus Christ began that work, he paused to do one of the most selfless things and that was to give us clarity, for us to give us a gift so that we would have a way to gather to remember him in such a way that we can encounter the cross every single day. Jesus said, after taking a loaf of bread, he broke the bread and he said, he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Eat all of you. And every time that you gather and you take bread and you eat from it, and you do it in this way, remember, remember me. And then he said something to his listeners that would have been completely out of the ordinary. These were Jews who have walked by the covenant of Moses their whole lives. Their identity was wrapped up. We're children of Abraham. We are recipients of the law. And Jesus said something that he probably couldn't have said three years before. After three years of walking with these disciples, he came to say something more powerful than go be a good religious person. Go obey the law, try your best, be good little boys and girls. Oh, we wish it was that easy. Jesus instead filled a cup of wine and he said to them, this is the new covenant that we have with God. And it is filled with my blood, which has been shed for you. It's been shed for the forgiveness of sins for many people. Take and drink, all of you. And whenever you gather and you drink from this cup, remember, remember me. Let us pray. Dear God, we're so blessed to again be in your house and receive this invitation to this table in remembrance and honor of your only son, Jesus. And the reason we're coming to this table is to remember why Jesus died that horrible death on the cross. His broken body, blood spilled out of his body, all of his blood, for our sins, nothing he had done. We pray that we will follow it teachings and do your work love you Lord love our neighbors and your will not ours be done in our lives it is in Christ's name we pray Amen, Amen. please come
Father, we ask now that as children fed by Jesus Christ, that we wouldn't leave this spot. We would keep our entire being wrapped up and being marked and sealed by Christ Jesus' work alone. May we forget right now our nationality. May we forget right now anything that we think we've done that would disqualify us from a relationship with you and that we would forget anything right now that makes us feel like we're better than other people we are sinners and yet we are covered in Christ's righteousness by his work alone may we not leave this space as we open your holy scriptures we listen to your gospel and we remember more about who you are and who we are becoming in Christ We know that your gifts of Christ and his blood are irrevocable. We know, Lord, that when we have the gift of faith, the justification that comes, we no longer have to work to manage it. We receive it and walk accordingly. With our eyes open and our hearts open as well, we pray that your scriptures undo us and burn away any part of us that's out of line, that's fighting against your mercies for us and for all those who walk in faith. Bless and keep us together, we pray, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ Jesus, that we could lift high the cross of Christ, that many, many, many more would come to adore your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The children are uh, invited to go with Holly if you would like. The big kids stay with me. (laughs) These are holy words. It's important to know that the Bible is God's property. It's a tool he uses to reveal himself. But the heart that he reveals himself to is the heart that wants to know him, not a heart that wants to have ammunition for you to argue with people, not self-justification, but a heart that longs for one thing and one thing alone, to know the work and will of the Father through Jesus Christ, his Son. So 
to receive now this, this word. This comes from Hebrews chapter 11. May the Father bless the reading, the hearing, the understanding of these words. By faith. Say, by faith. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith. Say it. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks even though he is dead. So this is referring to an earlier story in the Bible. And uh, as we begin, we're looking at a two-week series about generosity, gift-giving, that sort of thing. Um, it was funny because I was in a, in a finance committee meeting in March or April, and a, it's definitely a count in the beans meeting. And the past three years, this church have been just wonderful, incredible. I don't like the word incredible. That means not credible. Have you heard of the Credible Hulk? He, wear, he wears glasses, and he, and he cross-checks all of his references. Like, God's gospel is credible. It's not incredible. So it's been very credible. And uh, the, the provisions of this church have been really high. Well, we were in a meeting, and things are great. The church is in good condition. But compared to last year, which is scoreboard Paul, we're, we aren't doing what we were last year. Right? Uh, which is a sin for me to even respond because of that. So I went to my office in sin and rearranged my preaching calendar and said, well, in May, we're talking about money. And we're talking about giving, right? So, I, 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 Whatever. I'm a sinner. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sitting in my office, and I, I put that down on paper, and um, I start to look at what we're going to be preaching about. And God said, uh, no, um, don't, do not use my pulpit and my holy moment to talk about a church budget uh, that I'm taking care of, says the Lord. Uh, and yeah, he has. Um, so it's kind of a moot point. And at the same time, he said, instead, I'm going to give you a better word. A much better word. So he knows our Achilles heel. He knows how to get your attention. If, you've, if you're here today for the wrong reason, uh, don't worry. He still speaks to people who are here for the wrong reason. Uh, if you're here uh, for the right reason, um, God's going to show you um, even better tweaks in your heart that he's going to perform to make you more in love with him, uh, more receptive of his grace, and more beautiful to, to be an encouragement to the other brothers and sisters in the Lord. So that happened to me this week, which is always fun. So we've got the story of Cain and Abel. It's an Old Testament story. It's from Genesis chapter 4. And Hebrews teaches um, in line with a, a bigger... Hebrews teaches from 30,000 feet. And so you get a better scope of what happened during the Cain and Abel story. I'm going to be referring to the story a little bit. It's in Genesis chapter 4. If you want to follow along, uh, that's fine. If not, that's okay. But I just want to recount what happened uh, the day that Cain and Abel came to give offerings to God. First it says in Genesis 4.1, Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. By the way, uh, there's a sermon right there. Every conception, every uh, chance uh, for a, a husband and wife to have a child, it's a complete miracle, a gift from God. Uh, we've had our miracles occur in my family the past year or so. And so, first off, Eve says, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gives birth to his brother. His name was Abel. Now, Abel kept the flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry 
and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. What happens next? Cain kills Abel, right? And normally when I'm talking about Cain and Abel, that's what we're referring to. It turns out the human race is much more comfortable with cold-blooded murder than we are with God's election. <laughs> right? Ooh! Like, we're cool with the story about a brother killing his other brother. Literally, not just like, I'm going to, you know, like we all do. I'm going to kill you, but like literally killed his brother. His brother's dead now. And then he says, am I my, am I my brother's keeper? And then God implies, yes, you are. Like, that's what we love to look at. But we don't like to make eye contact with the fact that Cain and Abel both brought offerings to the Lord. One was received well and one wasn't. Is that clear? You feel the, the rub? Okay. That's where we're going to sit today. Now, you have two guys, um, and something's different about them. It wasn't made explicitly clear until the Holy Spirit breathed the book of Hebrews that talks about what the difference was between Abel versus Cain. Because you could guess, was did God hate farmers and loves ranchers? That would cause a fight in this town, wouldn't it? Does God hate farmers and, and love ranchers? Does God, maybe Cain uh, was just uh, ugly or something, and Abel was good looking. Or maybe um, Cain had bad breath, and Abel didn't. I don't know. Like, so you're like thinking of all the reasons why in the world would God accept a gift from one and not the other? And Hebrews says it. Hebrews 11 says, verse 3 says, Cain did not give his gift with faith, but Abel did. That's the X factor. It's the only difference that's explicitly mentioned between the two men. And that should worry us a little bit. So this morning I wanted to talk about the Abel side and then the Cain side and then wrap it up. Scripture says, in the course of time. Remember how I paused there? A little awkward, right? In the course of time. In the Hebrew, it means after a long, long time. Development. Now, I want to remind you that this is the first story after the fall of man. It's the first story. It's the first thing that happens. This is recorded in Scripture. Adam and Eve are expelled out of the garden. Next thing you know, you get this story. You got two children of Adam and Eve who are both trying to approach the Lord, and it's taken place over a long period of time. They bring their gifts one day. Abel, as we'll see, Abel was giving a gift to God as a man who already had a long term relationship with God. Cain didn't. By faith, by faith alone, according to Hebrews 11, Abel was, had been enjoying for a long period of time a connection and a relationship with his maker. We call him Yahweh and Father. Cain, or Abel was living into this relationship for a long period of time and one day then brought God an offering. Cain, on the other hand, didn't have that relationship, didn't have the righteousness that comes by faith alone, didn't have an okayness with him. And near the same time as Abel's offering, Cain brought his own offering and was treated poorly. We're going to talk about Cain for a while, and I want you to deal with the tension that should be in your heart right now. And then we're going to end with the gospel. Cain and Abel were very different in the way they gave a gift. And there are two primary ways they were different. 
The first way is that Cain, and this should rub you too, Cain believed that the reason you give a gift was as a personal investment to get something out of it. Strings attached. Have you ever wondered, why are they being so nice to me? And it could be different. I mean, sometimes people are nice to a preacher because they feel guilty about a sin. Uh, Jesus declared that the the temple had become a den of robbers, uh, which uh, by the time he came around here, that's why he flipped the tables and shut down the temple. A den of robbers, a den isn't where you do your robbing. A den is where you go put your feet up after you've robbed. So you'd live a horrible life, and then you'd come to church, you'd feel better about yourself. Whatever the goal was, what we see in Cain is he was giving for himself. Cain expected something out of it. There's a story I heard recently. I uh, read a, a book, The Prodigal God, and there's a story about a, a, a feudal system where there's a king and peasants and all, and, and one of the peasants was a farmer, and through the mystery of farming, he harvested the largest and most beautiful carrot the world has ever seen. And he brings this carrot to the king. And he brings the carrot to the king because he wants the king to enjoy it. He brings the carrot to the king, and the king has the ability to see into the heart of the man. And he realizes that the man is giving to the king solely for joy, solely for encounter, solely based on the king's desires, the king's joy. And he gave the carrot, and the king looked at the carrot and said, My God, how beautiful. He said, You know, I've got some acreage over here, a hundred times what you're working. I'm going to give it to you to work it. I said, I love him. I loved you before and I love you now the same, but I'm going to go work that land. I'm going to bring you more carrots too. Just because just of how we are. I'm not earning anything, we're just, I love you. Well, apparently in his court, there was a man who ever heard this, and it was a rich man, one of the stewards of the town. And this man said, you know, a hundredfold return's pretty darn good. And that guy just gave a carrot. So this man went home and he found his best horse. He scrubbed it down and brushed it, made it beautiful. He brought it to the king and said, King Almighty, I brought you this horse. And then he waited. And the king perceived in that man's heart that he gave for himself. And so the king said to him, Thanks. And took the horse and went inside. Cain was giving to get something. He was the horse guy. He, he believed he figured out some sort of system. He's the part of you and the part of me that believes there ought to be some sort of incentive, some sort of reward. If I go to church, my life ought to get easier. When you probably know that as soon as you get close to Jesus, your muffler falls off your car and your bank account runs out. Have you figured that out yet? There's like a specific demon for water pumps. I mean, like, as soon as you start living your life this way, it doesn't return an investment in the way you expected. You don't put quarters in a machine and get dollars out. Cain apparently was living this way, and the reason I can tell you he was living this way and gifting this way was because the explicitly named um, detailed gift that he gave as compared to Abel. I think it's interesting that the writer of Genesis, the spirit that breathed these words would go into detail about what the men gave. Now first you have, we'll do Abel, because I like his better, so did God. It said, Abel brought from the firstborn of his flock the fat portions. Specific, valuable, an expression of his love. Abel is the husband that the day he marries his wife, he begins to collect little things. And for 10 years, for 10 years, he starts to bind together by his own hands the ancient art of putting a book together. And he draws illustrations and he writes the story of how we met. And for 10 years, as an expression of his love and relationship with his wife, consistently pours out his heart 
He's deliberate. He chooses the timing. He, he, the gift he gives draws him closer to his wife. Not as a substitute for something he did wrong. He's so in love with his wife that, he, that he's, how can I express this love for my wife? And he, he picks and he chooses and he cares and he tries. In this, this moment, 10 years later, when he brings the gift, his relationship's been growing that 10 years too. And he brings the book to her and he says, Honey, nothing can change the root that we have in God Almighty. Nothing could change the fact that he brought us together. And holding hands with you is different than when we first met. It's better. And looking into your eyes is different than it was when we first met. It's not as electric. It's better. That's what Abel did. Whereas Cain used the most general term you can find in Hebrew. He said Cain brought some of the fruits of his soil. Cain's the guy that goes to Costco for a bunch of flowers when he's messed up. Now, guys, I'm not beating up on the guys here. because When you see a guy checking out with flowers at the grocery store, you're asking, what did he do right, what did he do wrong? You know, it's, They're different. They're different. It's not the gift. It's, is this gift an expression of a long-term relationship with God? Was this given by a relationship that's already established before you gave the gift? Or... What did you do wrong? Are you about to ask your wife if you can buy that bass boat? What are you buttering me up for? You see? This should be convicting. Because next week we're going to talk about generosity between each other. How to be kind. and, and, and to, to, I, I know God's pre- having me preach this series because there's people in this church that are on the fence about doing something dramatic and generous. And they're like, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can give that person a car and go by. I don't, I don't know if I can. This is a word that's been put on me, and I know there's people that need to hear it this week. I'm encouraging you, encouraging you, if and when you act in generosity, to do it with faith. Not Cain, but Abel. Abel already had the relationship with God. He, he's already married to God. He, wasn't earning anything, and he wasn't paranoid. I, I, I heard somebody years ago tell me one of the best things, this is horrible, one of the best things that uh, they decide to do in their marriage is keep divorce as an option because it makes me try harder. How, ex, I didn't say it, you know. I, no, <laughs> I thought, what lousy secular logic that is. That's horrible. That's to treat your relationship as a marketplace where I'm going I'm to do this for my wife and she owes me this and she's going to do this for me and I heard that. What is this, the mafia? You call a favor on you? That's how we treat God when we give to Him without faith. It causes us to ask the question, I'm a good person. How could this happen to me? You're not a good person. Jesus is the only good person. The bad thing he went through, he chose. So settle down, hop along. <laughs> your, your setting with God, your, your relationship with God, your connection with God is expressed in your generosity before Him, your radical obedience to Him, but it is not what establishes your relationship with Him. If that were the case, everything you've ever done is with strings attached. And St. Paul would say, I count it all as loss, as rubbish, what I did before I knew Jesus. I was the Lord trying to use God as an asset to get what I want. I'm the King of the universe. He's one of my tools, one of my shovels. I'm going to use Him I'm going to leverage him. I figured him out if I go to church, if I tithe, if I listen to a sermon, if I work really hard, if I'm a good person, then he owes me. And as soon as we don't get what we want, we become very angry or we become downcast. So, 
This was written and declared way before Noah. A long time ago. This is the first thing that happened. This is the first sin. It wasn't murder. It was approaching God and trying to use God or earn His love. First sin. Whoa. Convicting. That's number one, is that we give for me. I give for me. I smile at you for me. I, I preach sermons because y'all make me feel good because you're here. Is he not putting his thumb on our sin? Is he not saying, apart from me, says the Lord, you're all Cain. You don't know how to give without doing it for your survival. You've been so conditioned to give so that people think better of you. Or maybe, you know, come to my birthday party, I'll come to yours. I'll buy you a $20 gift if you buy me a $20 <laughs> gift. It's this war of giving. It is not love. We become so conditioned. Apart from Christ, we do not know how to be gift givers, how to be generous without having a string attached. Can you see your heart right now? Number two. And this is, this is what really broke my heart. Because this moves from using God to a better thing, which is wanting God. And you could even argue the second reason Cain gave to God was to get what Abel had. The Lord read his heart. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted by me? He wanted what, he wanted what Abel had. He, he, was, he was that brother that said, I want you to look at me like you look at my kid brother. I want to make you proud. I want you to I want you to stand tall when you talk about me. I want to be accepted. I want the relationship that you have with Abel. And so Cain comes again and again and again and he he, he, he's moved past using God. Now he's wanting God. And he's going to want God on the basis of what he can give God. And he keeps giving him gifts. And he's, I'm going to church and I'm, 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 I'm wanting you. I don't want what you can give me. I don't want to put in a quarter and get out a dollar. I, I, I don't. Help me. Help me. I want you. He was trying to get what Abel had. He was trying to create a scenario where the conditions were correct and now he and his father could go hold hands and skip through the, through the lilies. He was wanting to have these man-to-mans with the father. He was wanting to have this perfectly set-up moment that God would call righteousness. Acceptable conditions before the God before our God, that, that we could have an encounter with God that's completely established, that's burning in purity, and we could stand before God and have a relationship with God, not because of what we do and not, not, not because of what we don't do, but we get to be with God. That's what Cain wanted, and he thought he could get it through works. And Hebrews 11 said, here's the deal. Ultimately, that's what his heart was after. That's what your heart's after. Being accepted by the one who made you. Our greatest fear is rejection, and that's what Cain went through. The greatest fear is hell, because it's God rejecting you. It's not what it's like there. It's that there was an active moment where God said, I don't want you near me. It's our greatest fear. We don't know how to give without strings attached 
Our greatest fear is that we're not accepted by God. And so we become Cain and we try to give, 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 give. And then Jesus Christ, who is in the Old Testament too, he is the word of God. He was with Abel. Jesus Christ performed the only acceptable offering before God. Abel's was nothing. To compare Cain and Abel's offering is like to compare the most two intelligent cockroaches. I'm not impressed. Their offering wasn't the issue. Jesus Christ alone has provided the offering that's not only acceptable before God, but rejoice before the Father. And we now know through this long lineage of faith that if we have faith in what Jesus did, if we know that our great high priest is standing before the Father, Jesus Christ, in rightness with him, now we don't have to struggle. We don't have to strive. We can rest in our soul. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. Come to me who are tired of proving themselves. That I will prove righteousness on your behalf. Come to me who have no hope, have, are completely discouraged. Come to me, says Jesus, and I will give you exactly what your heart needs to rest before the Father. And our pride and our sense of control can't believe the gospel without help. We become Cain, and we say, no, I need to earn it. I need to earn it. And works come in different ways, y'all. How often, I mean, I've to church for 18 years, mad at God. Mad at God. Go to church every Sunday. I don't drink. I didn't. I had sex. I didn't have sex before marriage. I, I don't, I, look at my grades, God. You care about performance, right? Who hasn't done that? The difference between Cain and Abel was that Abel was smitten and struck with faith. And according to Scripture, faith and faith alone is what produces a righteous moment where you can actually be connected with the Father, where you can begin writing that 10-year book with God and you present it to God, where you're free, where you can show up and go to wherever on a mission trip for three months, where you can be generous with a brother or sister, you can give them that car. Be careful when you bless someone with a car because normally it's a really, really trashy car. We, we can, you can do these moments of generosity. I'm telling you, you and of yourself cannot solve the problem that you don't know how to be generous without strings attached or to be accepted by others. But when you have faith in Jesus Christ, there's nothing the world can take from you and there's nothing you can gain from the world. And finally, for the first time in your life, when you give, you're a cheerful giver. When you say yes to God, you're doing it as a lover. You're doing it as someone who's completely good to go. That can't be bought. That cannot be worked for. Sorry, Americans. It can only be received as a gift from God's initiating love that strikes your heart, and he's not having me preach this for no reason, that strikes your heart today and pierces you and says, if you can just accept what my son has done, you go from Cain to Abel with no process, with no PhD, with no new members class. The providential work of God to pierce the heart and convert a soul fully on the basis of who Jesus is and him alone is the only thing it's going to take you from a law person to a life person. I am of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's called me to stand in this church and preach the gospel. And sometimes that's highly intolerant. And I do not know where we got this idea. That there are multiple ways of salvation. That God loves this more than that. When in reality, clearly displayed for all the world to see, the only thing the Father looks at and rejoices over, the only name that he looks at and says, this is my son, whom I'm well pleased, the only person of righteousness is Jesus. Receive the good news. Receive the good news.
that righteousness is yours if you have faith in Christ. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that the X factor, the the difference between Cain and Abel, which wasn't a matter of intellect or striving, it was a matter of love and faith. It was a matter of having a relationship with you that you've initiated that's authentic. Lord, we pray that that faith, that righteousness, which is credited to those of faith, would be displayed prominently in your holy church across this earth. We pray that we would quit pity paddling and and patty caking with false gospels and works righteousness and, hey, just try your best. Or if we follow his teachings, Jesus might be nice to us. May we no longer be Cain, but Abel. And we may get slain. We may be thrown down in the grave. And yet, because of faith, somehow, you're pleased. You're still pleased. You're still, in, we and you, we're together, we're, we're one, we're united. That's nothing that can be stopped. That's nothing that can be bought. As Luther taught us, let goods and kindred go this mortal life also. Even the body they might kill, but God's truth abideth still. May we rest in the truth that Christ Jesus is sufficient. And we plead his blood at the moment of judgment, at the moment of a crisis in our lives. We do not cry out, save me, church attendance. Save me, baptismal vows. Instead, we say, save me, Jesus, the living God. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Please rise for our closing song. I'll be in the back. If the Lord's stirring in your heart, I'd love to hear about it. Go for it.
Father, we open our heart now, and, and I, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm aware that, uh, that there's a fight within us to not drown, uh, to, to every instinct in us is survival and clinging, and yet Jesus says, you know, I didn't come here to enter your, your life. I didn't come here to, 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 to just be one of the many friends you have. I came here for you to die. And then you'll have life. And Lord, I, I ask now by the power of the Holy Spirit that the, the, heart, the people that are looking at their hearts right now and seeing what's up, seeing how inevitable this is, may we drown today. And may you give us that new breath. Life apart from our striving and struggling, life apart from uh, us surviving and proving ourselves and whatever that is, and trusting that in Christ, when we become part of this massive flood, this massive tidal wave, some people are running, some people are screaming, some people are fighting on the top, that when we are in Christ, we get to float and live, and we get to be part of the gospel that's sweeping over this nation. How much control there is. We pray in Jesus' name, you and you alone convict hearts today. We pray there's a freedom and a trust for people that are on that fence to just take a gulp. Taste and see the Lord's good and that he's here to give life, healing and hope. And that what we called life before, once you have life in Christ, what we, have, what we called it before is a joke. It's painful, it's awful, there's tears, there's struggle, it's no good. And in Christ, once for the first time in our life, we are alive. Bless and give us the freedom today. I pray you continue to preach to our church, including me. Convict our hearts, stir us up, Lord. And, and give us the freedom to take that first gulp. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Please join me now for our benediction. And now may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his face and shine his glory and countenance upon you and grant you the peace of his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.